Okay, perfect. We are live. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, today we have with us uh, Professor Conrad Coding. He's had an exemplary career of uh, being a neuroscientist and working with the normative models of motor control uh, it's, and its use in rehabilitation, uh, neural decoding, uh, deep learning, meta science, and more recently studying causality in the brain. He's currently based at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, has previously worked at uh, University College London, MIT, and Northwestern University. Uh, with that, let's warmly welcome Dr. Herding, and I hope you enjoy it. Great. It's great to be here. Thanks, for, uh, thanks everyone, for tuning in. Uh, it's also a great honor for me to get to talk at Osnabrück. It's been a long time since I last was there, and uh, it's just a delight to have the chance to give a talk in front of my former supervisor who has like had so much impact on the way I do science. And um, as you saw in Ashima's introduction, I'm not very well focused on like anything. And in a way that is on purpose because there's just so many super exciting questions that I just have trouble just being in one area and it would just be boring after a while, I guess. So in any case, um, uh, thanks for the great introduction. Hold on, I haven't yet shared my screen and so you can't see me. Um, how long are we into the pandemic and I still can't do it. Um, in any case, and now this should be working. Um, my talk is titled Causality in Neuroscience and Beyond. It will in parts, just talk about causality because I think it's super important and I think it's essential to the way we think in neuroscience. I think it's essential to the way we think in medicine. And it's one of these things that I feel like usually, at least in my past, I, I didn't get much training on it. And then I want to talk about some ideas where there's like, I think exciting opportunities in this space. So let me first uh, advertise something. So. We run Neomatch Academy, which is this big um, online summer course where people learn computational techniques in neuroscience. So uh, we had about 200, so it's a, very, it's a group based curriculum. We had about 200 TAs, each of them teaching about 10 students at a time through a program that was designed by dozens of professors and uh, literally hundreds of volunteers. It will again run this summer. If you want to train in computational neuroscience techniques, it is a great opportunity in my perspective. In fact, a good number of things that I will show today have some overlap with the causality day that we have here in Neuromatch Academy. So what's the outline of the talk? I will first want to talk about correlation and causation because in lots of ways in our minds, correlation and causation are very similar. And you can see that throughout neuroscience. I remember when I was an undergraduate in Heidelberg was the first time where I saw a professor, where I consciously saw a professor equate correlation and causation. It was in developmental neurobiology. And it, it kind of back then I didn't have the toolkit to formulate that criticism right. But it boils down to, I think that there's a difference between the small systems that us humans are really good at kind of simulating in our heads in which correlation and causation are often very similar and big systems like brains in which correlation and causation can be very different. I will then talk about the nature of the differences between correlation and causation. And uh, I want to also focus on that in many cases they cannot be overcome. Now, there is this notion that like in a way we all have that if, you if I just give you enough data and you like run a good algorithm on it, I give you enough data, then you can figure out how things work. In the domain of causality, there are lots of cases where we cannot estimate causality in the limit of infinite data. And that often comes shocking once you start thinking about it. I will then talk about how for some clinically relevant applications and neuroscience research questions, we can after all obtain causality, namely in the context of quasi-experiments. So let's dive right in. 
So let me first have a, my definition of causality. A lot of people say, oh, but there's lots of different definitions of causality and they're all different and like it's really just all mushy philosophy. No, it's not. The way you or me use philosophy in everyday neuroscience life, it's perfectly well defined. And here's the definition. Let A and B be events. No? A could be the event, a neuron, one neuron spikes at time one. Let B be another event. It could be neuron B spikes at that point of time, or it could be the activity of some brain area or something. It could, like A and B are events that we can observe. Causation exists if and only if, if we had changed A to A star, which in this case could be, I prevent neuron one spiking at time zero. Or alternatively, I make neuron one spike very actively at time one. If I had changed event A to A star, then the probability for B would have been different. No, that's what we intuitively mean. Ca causation means if I can rewind time, I like tinker in the system, I change it a little bit, how is the future different in that system that I tinker? Now, uh, now, now I should say first in lots of domains, this is obviously what we care about. Now like A could be, I give you a drug and B could be, you die of cancer. <laughs> we profoundly want to know the relationship between those, but it's also, super central to neuroscience. And let's talk about that. So, um, so, so when we talk about mechanisms in neuroscience, there is a deep notion of causality that is in there. And there's different levels of question asking that we can have there. We might say, we want to predict what happens if we do randomized per perturbations. Now, like in the sense, like say we want to fix something in the brain, we have a disease or something. We often want to ask, we, we often want to understand a causal chain. Whenever I show a red light to this mouse, it pushes a button. What is this chain as we go through the brain that connects the light that we show with the behavior that we observe? We, um, uh, but in, in lots of ways, uh, let, me, let me skip a bit the counterfactual. Um, um, in lots of ways, a description that is satisfactory for us neuroscientists usually has the property that we have, say, here's the chain, the causal chain going from, say, a stimulus to a behavior. And here are the components for it. So why does everyone love Hodgkin Huxley so much? Now, if you go to random neuroscientists, hey, what's your favorite model? Hodgkin Huxley. Peter, what's your favorite model? Uh, Hodgkin Huxley. Okay, I don't know. I haven't asked Peter. He, he, he might, uh, he, he, he's, uh, he, he often has like very interesting non-standard answers to things. But like, there's a very strong bias that, uh, that, that we have in that space. And, um, and why is Hodgkin Huxley so great? We have a causal chain going from voltage at one place or at one point of time to a voltage at another point of time. And so we understand that chain, what's in that chain, and we understand the components of the chain, which is there's voltage gated channels that open and that like uh, makes, the, makes the action potential go. So at some level, when we say mechanism in neuroscience, what we usually mean is causality and an understanding on how, of how the links in that causal chain work. I should also say causality is central in life and machine learning. Arguably, in our life and in machine learning, there's just one purpose, which is there are different possible worlds for us, and we try to choose actions that make the future a little more pleasant for us. No? That is the nature of life. And, um, and, and now what does that mean in machine learning? Now, people in machine learning often say, well, we don't need causality. Well, if we have a system that does, uh, that, that does uh, classification, say digit classification, there's a causal reason why we do that, which is we can then automatically send postal letters to the right person, even if it's handwritten. And the ultimate question in life is, would it be better for me if I chose A or if I choose B? <laughs> and that's just a large number of subsequent A, B choices. Okay, so what makes causal inference difficult? In a hypothetical world, it's very easy for me to figure out causality. No, I take 
two worlds. In one world, I make event A happen. In the other world, I prevent event A from happening. And I take the two worlds and like run the worlds forward until B happens uh, potentially many times to get at that probabilistic notion of causality. And that way I can know what's the, what's the, what's the causal effect of A. In fact, they can ask, what's the causal effect of A on everything by just simulating lots of worlds? The slight problem is um, the world doesn't easily afford us to give us a copy of itself. So the problem here is really, we want to know, does A, the lower node affect the higher node B? The problem is that there is a world around it. And that world that's around it will usually influence A and it will influence B. So if I see some statistical regularity between A and B, I cannot know, is it that A made B happen? Or is it that something else made A happen and then subsequently made B happen? It's fundamentally and provably impossible to know the difference between those generally. And there's a continuum on how important confounding is in the world. For example, if you play chess or Atari or you do ImageNet classification, arguably, there's no confounders. Not like it's, it's all the data that is relevant for your decision is displayed for you right there. Now, there's cases where there's few confounders. Now, in StarCraft, I play against one of you, and uh, you may have some you, you may have some goals. One of your goals might be to make me believe something wrong, and that will then confound the variables that I observe. And then we can be in domains like medicine where there's countless confounders. Now, like if you have someone who's good at talking with doctors, they will be, uh, they, they, they get different treatment and then they have different outcomes. And that is usually problematic. Now, like uh, for example, if you correlate people taking like random vitamins to any life outcome, dying of cancer, dying by accident, dying in a homicide, uh, any of those things, you find that vitamins really prevent you from dying in a homicide. Well, why is that the case? Now, like you find that correlation, people who take vitamins don't get killed so often. It's not because like somehow the vitamins like magically make you repellent against bullets, which is somewhat common in this country. Um, but it's rather that they, uh, that, um, that it's that rich people tend to take vitamins in particular in America, and which people don't get shot all that, all that often. Not like, and here we have a case of confounding. Uh, and I should also mention in the case of the brain, not like in with today's technology, you record from 100 neurons, maybe 10,000 neurons if you're really heroic about it. If you record from 10,000 neurons, that's a tiny part of all the neurons in the brain. All the neurons that you don't record from effectively work as confounders for the questions that you want to ask. And um, and so great. So let's briefly talk about a simulated call. So what I wanted to do now is like produce somewhat of an intuition on the roles of confounding and uh, how confounding affects real systems. So let's simulate a really, really, really trivial system, uh, which is the which is an n-dimensional dynamical system uh, where x t is the vector that we have at any given point of time. It is in first order approximation a linear system. I add some sigma nonlinearity. You can take that out. You just need to be careful and over certain things. Okay, we have x t plus one, a sigma times a x t plus epsilon t. Epsilon t is just like isotropic noise, no? like if you want, like if you think about it in terms of this as neurons, every neuron has their own little noise generator, which is probably real. And then we have each neuron has synaptic inputs to all other neurons, which is characterized by that matrix A. And like, then there's some saturation potentially. Again, anything I will show you that sigma we can remove or add, it, it makes no difference. We just need to make sure that we uh, initialize more carefully. So now the real causal matrix is the connectivity matrix between them. So A is arguably ground truth causality in the system. No, and, uh, 
And why, if I perturb one neuron at one point of time, then at the next point of time, the probability of spiking for all the neurons that are they, they, that have kind of rows in that relevant vector will be elevated or lowered if we do that perturbation. Okay, so and then we add um, uh, we add isotropic noise. We initialize to zero. I should say we do another thing to A, which is we make sure that in, you know, like if we want the linear domain to make sense, we need to be able to make sure that it doesn't go to infinity. And so we make sure that the largest singular value of that matrix is 0.99. We basically rescale all singular values. But here we have a really simple system. In fact, a system where it's small, we can meaningfully think about it. So what we ha have here is we have this A matrix in the top represented in two ways. On the right hand side as the matrix that it is, on the left side as the network, because people really like these days to take matrices and instead plot them as a set of errors. We can do that, no problem. Okay, so what you see in the top is this A matrix. What you see at the bottom is the time delay one correlations. Now, like this seems like the right measure. I look at the activity of a neuron, and then I look at the other neurons at the next time step, given the dynamics that we have. There's time delay one, that is the only thing that is happening, and I look at this correlation matrix. So what do we see here? In first approximation, it looks just like the A matrix, no, the time delay correlation matrix. Great, correlation is causation. So can Conrad please stop his talk? Well, no. Conrad's not going to stop his talk uh, because uh, because you will uh, let's let's see this breakdown. We now go with the very same dynamical system, so no no changes. Not like we equally have here. We had six neurons. We now go to hundred neurons. Exactly the same dynamical system. No gimmicks. No nothing playing with it. On the left hand side we have the true connectivity matrix. I'm not showing you the the. The, the errors because they, it's, it's just too many notes to show that meaningfully. But look, those two matrices look almost completely different. Hmm, that's weird. Not like, like we just first convinced ourselves that correlation is causation. Why did it go away? Well, let's see how it goes to, uh, so away. We can change the number of neurons in the simulation, the dimensionality of the simulation and we can plot the similarity between the actual causal matrix A and the inferred time delayed matrix R as a function of the size of the system. And look, it goes basically for the small systems, the correlation is very good. And if I say correlation, now what's on the y-axis? It's just like, I take the two matrices, I take them into vectors, I just plot the raw correlation between them. And it goes to, 0.2 or close to zero as we approach 100, it really gets to, it, 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 as a, it very quickly goes to be zero. Now, why is this such a problem? It means that whenever in our head we think about systems, we are like, yeah, correlation is causation. Whenever we actually have a big system, correlation totally isn't causation. The systems that we look at are almost all of this big nature. Now, like if you look at like the metabolism within a single cell, that's a million metabolites. We are in a big domain. In the brain, we have 10 to the 11 neurons. We're in a big domain. Like, like, like almost everywhere where we really think we're big, but we're still humans who have like intuitions that are bootstrapped from small systems. Now, what's happening here? What happens is that if I give you a big system that is dynamic, it produces its own dynamics. There's certain modes of it that are big and certain modes of it that are small. We have all that noise on all those many neurons that push all those components a little bit. And some of the components are big and those big components dominate the dynamics of the neurons. And by dominating that, they make that, that correlation causation is very different. Now, let's see why this is a problem. Now, like, um, uh, let's, let's, let's first about, talk about regression. Now, like, there's an equation that probably many of you have seen. If not, look at it, it's beautiful. If I have a linear system, uh, if I have a linear system, a, uh, uh, y is uh, wx plus noise, 
and I want to estimate the weights or like in this case, um, a, uh, in, in this case, we'd have y is beta x. Then how can we calculate that? Well, we take the correlation matrix x prime x, the inverse of that, and we multiply that with the correlation matrix x prime y. No? And this is, and you can show, and this is super beautiful, that this is the solution that minimizes the mean squared error in the reconstruction. So why is there a problem? Well, in practice, then we, I'll slightly deviate. The problem that I've shown you so far comes from mistaking correlation and causation. What we will now do is we will deal with the situation where we have k dimensions, only a subset of which is observed. And we ask ourselves what happens because of the variables that we don't observe. Example, we measure 100 cortical brain areas using fmi what are the dimensions that we don't measure well the 10 to the 11 minus 100 dimensions that we don't measure no so the question is now if we do a regression in this case and we pretend we pretend that we have all variables that we do when we do that regression what is the bias that we are inducing for that and so what we now believe is we say that yi is xi beta which is the previous time. These are the interaction terms between the dimensions that we have observed, plus zi delta, which are the dimensions that we didn't observe times the, the, the matrix delta that is others effects, plus of course not. No? So it's, it's, it's just a model now that contains the relevant, uh, the observed variables and the non-observed variables and the noise. Otherwise it's the same. Now, what we can do is we can just take the equation for y and put that into the equation for linear regression. Okay, so we have x prime x inverse times x prime times y, and here's the term for y. And then we can say, how can we formulate the, the error that we have? Well, the expected value of what we estimate with that is beta, which is the true effect. That's great. Now, like, like, like first we have a term that is what we are looking at times the same x prime x inverse matrix that, that we have for the regular regression times the expected value of x prime z given x times delta, which are the influences. No, no, we have two things. We have beta, which are the influences between variables that we record, and delta are the influences from the variables that we don't record. Now, the, in, the, the influences between variables that we don't record will be of the same order of magnitude to the variables that we do record, no, like it's 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 the same thing. It's like the interactions between neurons or the the reaction dynamics of a reaction. If we talk about metabolites, so like like can be anything there. No, they they're of the same nature. And then we have this term, the expected value of the correlation x prime with c. Now, if you look at 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 the brain, you find that just about everything has some correlation with something else, and. Um, uh, they, they, here's just like a co and con paper that looked at that. If you look at pairs of neurons and lots of areas, there's some correlation. So what we have is now we have like the x prime x term, which is exactly the same that we had before. We have the expected term, which has the correlation, which is going to be for real neurons 0.1 or something in that range. And we have delta, the interactions that we don't know about. Now, Let's say something about the dimensionality of this. Beta is dimensionality of how many dimensions we observe. The second term is all the dimensions that we don't observe. So the first term has 100 terms. The second term has 10 to the 11 terms. But yes, the second term is factor 10 smaller because of this correlation correction, which means that in this case, that second term entirely dominates the, the estimate. Now, why is this so problematic? There is no amount of data that makes this go away. Now, like the beta here, this is the expected value in the limit of going to infinity. So no amount of data fixes the second part. If we have reasons to believe that that second part is large, and I just tried to give you the intuition on why I think it is large, then no amount of correlation-based mapping with an infinite number of subjects and trillions of dollars of NIH funding will tell us how strongly brain areas interact with one another. 
And now you've seen this equation here. It's not that I invented this equation. This equation is decades old and very commonly used in econometrics. Let me give you a positive use of that same equation. Uh, we observe a sudden correlation of smoking and dying of, uh, of cancer. Now, back in the ages where people weren't so sophisticated, people were like, oh, but we can't know anything. It could be confounding. You know? like, it's like the risk takers, they're the smokers, and they also get cancer because of some other risk taker thing. Now that, and, and, and people kind of try to use that to explain away the, pro, uh, the, the many deaths that are there. Well, it turns out that we can directly use that. We can say, well, a great point, actually. Let's take the correlation between risk-taking and dying of cancer, and let's take the correlation between risk-taking and, um, uh, and smoking, and let's see if that is of the right order of magnitude. And along with this, in the positive case, you can put bounds on things and say, yeah, we might be wrong, but we will only be as wrong as the omitted variable, by, uh, variable bias equation says. Or alternatively, we can use this to basically say, oh, look, that second term is infinitely bigger than the first term. So probably our estimates are pointless. OK, so now, what are the popular solutions that we use in neuroscience for, uh, for doing that? We use complicated model fitting. It turns out that nothing in complicated model fitting makes the omitted variable bias go away. You can like very easily prove that, you, that the effect is indistinguishable. Um, but if the math becomes sufficiently complicated, we will no longer see that there's a big logical mistake in it and that it equates correlation with causation. In particular, if we take these algorithms that do complicated math and use all kinds of words relating to causality when we refer to the components of those algorithms. People use model comparisons. Again, model comparisons don't make it go away. It's just like, it's just wishful thinking in a way. And we, we use randomized perturbations, which is totally fine. So let's talk about randomized. In fact, we just had a paper today come out that reviews TMS in the MRI scanner, which is a very, very clean technique in that regard. And there should, there's also quasi experiments and we'll talk about that. So let's briefly, I, I want to teach you a little bit or tell you a little bit about the quasi-experimental frameworks, and for that we need the potential outcomes framework as an output. It, 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 it's been popularized by Ruben, uh, Rubens. It's, it's very popular in econometrics. What's the idea there? We can say that potential futures, potential outcomes, are in a way real. Now, like I could say, there exists a potential future if I give one drug to Conrad and another potential future if I give another uh, drug to, the, uh, to Conrad. It just happens that we can only ever observe one of them, but they're both real. No? Like, um, one is the real one, the other one is the counterfactual one. We never observe the counterfactual along with the real one. What they do is they say the treated, and treating is just like the setting, the, the, the value to one arbitrary, the value of A to one arbitrary value. The treated and the untreated, we call it uh, Y of one, when if it's treated, Y of zero if it's not treated. And now these two potential outcomes exist for everyone in there. So let me first show you that randomized control trials are correct. We have, uh, we have K measurements here. Uh, we have Y zero and Y one. Um, for every person, there would be one for each. The treatment effect is defined as the expected value of the difference of being treated with not being treated, which is one over n of the sum of uh, y i uh, y one of i minus y zero of i, and then you, we can say, well, in RCT we randomly assign you. Therefore, we have a we have basically samples from one side, samples from the other side. Given that they are uh, given that they're randomly chosen, we can then prove that the expected value is the same. So it's unbiased. So as opposed to the omitted variable bias equation, you can now prove that there is no bias. And if there's no bias, it's just regular estimates and it will go, the variance goes down as one over n, as always. Okay, so let's talk about uh, quasi experiments. So there's observational methods. Observational methods means I just, someone just gives me some data set. And that's the so-called experiment. So for the economist, an experiment just means that they randomize something. 
It doesn't mean that there's like pipettes involved. It just means if you randomize something, it's an experiment. If you don't randomize something, it's not an experiment. And then there's quasi experiments in between. Quasi experiments, the way to think about it is that the universe randomizes something for us. And let's talk about a few examples of that. So in America, there's this thing called certificate of merit. Everyone in America takes an exam at some point of time. And um, in that exam, um, they ask you all kinds of questions, but the, the outcome is, uh, the effect is that it gives you, if you're good enough, if you're above some threshold, it gives you a certificate of merit. It's like a federal certificate that says, you're awesome. And then you can, you can say, well, uh, does that certificate actually do anything? And, there's a, and, and how should we think about it? Now you could say there exists Y of zero, which is what would happen if no one would get a certificate? That is the red line. And then there exists an equally hypothetical curve where if everyone would get the certificate. Now these two curves, I observe one curve on the right of the threshold, I observe the other curve on the left of the threshold. What do I know about those curves? Well, I know that they're smooth. Why do I know that they're smooth? If I take any one of you, give the same exam a couple of times, you will sometimes be a few points above it, a few points below it. Therefore, the, 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 the function is basically low pass. And if it is, we know that it will smoothly run through that. So the economists use this technique, which is called regression discontinuity design in that area, to estimate what's called the local average treatment effect. The local average treatment effect basically says, if I take people that are close to the threshold, um, what's the causal effect on those people? We cannot know anything very far away from it. No, it could be that like the people that have very, very low uh, scores, if they would get like that, you're a brilliant certificate, their lives would be worse because like it just wouldn't work out for them. It could be that the guys all the way on the right hand side, they're like so sure about themselves already that it doesn't make any difference. So, but we can say something about people in the vicinity. So here's the original paper. And I always like, like looking at these original papers. So this is the Thistleweight Campbell paper. On the x-axis, you, the, 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 you have the exam. On the y-axis, you have the percent of students winning a scholarship. And there's two graphs. It's hard for you to read it here. But basically, there's the people who win a, a, a scholarship and the people who win like a really big scholarship, which in that case was $150 or more. What you, can, what you, see, what you do is you fit a linear function that has a discontinuity at zero to each of them. And what you can see is there's a clear discontinuity at that threshold where it really seems to help you. Like what that means is that if you want four people that are close to the threshold, it, getting the certificate makes it more likely that they will also get a scholarship in the future. And so, and, and here we can claim that there's a causal effect. There's a beautiful piece of math behind that that highlights what exactly the criteria are. An important criterion is, for example, that you can't cheat. So if, you, if the rich people find a way of taking the exam twice, if they failed the first time, in that case, the method would be wrong. And the cool thing about the method is that we can actually find out if this kind of cheating happens. I want to just mention another cool paper in that domain here, which is an Angus paper from 1997. So the sage Maimonides in the 12th century, a big uh, leader in Jewish thought at that point of time, uh, said that no class should have more than 40 pupils. And uh, well, the state of Israel listened because Maimonides is one of the big influences of modern Jewish thought still. And so there's a hard rule in Israel, you cannot have classes larger than 40. And what we see here is the actual class size as a function of uh, the school size. And we see exactly what we should expect there, which again gives us an opportunity to do causal inference. And my money and Angrest very nicely showed that indeed this, uh, we can see how it helps for school, for you to be in smaller uh, class sizes. In particular, there's a lot of power in the like 30 to 50 domain because every, every school with 50 pupils has two classes of 25 versus the school with 30 has one class that might be very big.
Okay, now there's sanity checks. Now we can, how do we see that there's cheating going on? Now, like, it's always good to just assume that there's no cheating, but like, uh, I see a lot of apparent such things when I analyze, when we analyze medical data sets. So if there's cheating, you expect that there's local non uh, local uh, local effects. Now, like, let's say if everyone's cheating, everyone who's just above the below the threshold, like retakes it. What we will see is in the density function that it goes like this. It tanks because all these guys retake it, and then it has an extra peak and and it would look like this. Alternatively, what if suddenly certain groups are cheating? Maybe the rich are cheating. High socioeconomic status meets cheating, then you will have a discontinuity in such covariates. And there's standard techniques within econometrics to look for that. Now, let me briefly talk about the variance of those estimators. Now, like, you will always have best power if you randomize things. If I want to know how neurons are related, I want to like control them. If I want to do an experiment on human behavior, I want to control all the, all the data that goes in. At the same time, there's some emerging data sources, like we, we've been working on Twitter data with things like that, where you have high power. So let's look at what we need. Relative to the randomization, we need an extra, uh, uh, when it comes to the variance, we have an extra factor three that comes from the fact that we have extra parameters, basically. And then, of course, we have a variance square term that we share with any of the other techniques. And, um, that's the variance in the outcomes that we look at. And then we have the number of people in the bandwidth. So behavior could be nonlinear, in which case we can only use people that are halfway close to the threshold. Um, that number, so instead of the overall number, we have only the people that are close to the threshold here. And then we have P squared, and I haven't introduced what P is. P is the proportion of people who comply. Now there could be people who will always be treated and people who will never be treated. And in medicine, uh, that's, that's highly prevalent. That's just, there's just certain people who just don't care about that the guideline says above 130 blood pressure, you're hypertonic and you should be treated. They just like, okay, look, doctor treat me already or like, I'm not taking any of these drugs. <laughs> and, uh, and, and this P is that proportion for that. Now, uh, what makes this method problematic is let's say you have low compliance and doctors are notoriously low at compliance there. When 90% ignore the guidelines, it means that you need 100 times as many people for this. Okay, now potential everywhere. Uh, there's treatment thresholds. And like, even if you do, uh, let's say if you do uh, therapy or something, there's often, a, a, a statement which says we will only enroll people into this if their if their questionnaire is above some value. Absolutely possible. We've been working on NIH grant data. We aren't allowed to talk about it, but basically you get grants up to some threshold and not beyond that threshold. Uh, pretty much any recommender system does that. Now, like on the first page of Google, are uh, the ten results that get the highest internal score. Now, what's the cause and effect of being on the first page? Well, with such techniques, you can look at that. Uh, enrolling based on needs. Now, like uh, there is the possibility of doing pre-planned RDDs where you say, oh, I only have money to enroll a thousand people into our program. Let's enroll the thousand most worthy people. Well, now did my program work? Well, I don't know. I didn't randomize things. Well, actually I can know. I take the hundred people that I just barely enrolled in the 100 people that I just barely didn't enroll, I compare the two of them, I have a pretty decent local causal estimate. I should say there's an obvious optimization problem with it. You know, like if I have a threshold and I find a jump in that and I, I know what I want to optimize my system for. For example, here's a case of taxis. On the x-axis, we have the fare that they have. The company uses a threshold where up to $15, they say, do you want to give one, two, or $3? And above $15, they say, do you want to give 15%, 20%, or 25%? And you have that threshold. And you could say, well, hold on. Like, what would be the right way? Uh, what would be the ideal threshold? You can say, I take the y of 1 on the right-hand side, and I extrapolate it into the space on the left giving me an estimate. And with that, I can kind of say how I should change the threshold. Now, taxis, I don't care about taxis. I, I find these like, please tip me things very obnoxious. 
But in medicine, that same question is very meaningful. And like we can often get sheer arbitrary amounts of like health insurance data where I have like who tested what on which blood pressure and or like uh, on which uh, blood marker, what's the threshold I can compare there and I can say, okay, like, look, given that, that evidence, you should move that. It turns out that under the right circumstances, these, uh, uh, these uh, quasi-experimental techniques need very, very little extra assumptions relative to uh, relative to randomized control trials. So, so in that sense, I think it's quite nice. I should also say, you could view that same idea from the perspective of nuance. And here I'm talking about more research-oriented things. Um, so this is a nice paper by Ben Lansdell, where you could say, I'm a neuron. I want to help the organism in which I am. I can observe how good things are, maybe through the dopamine system, whatever it is. How can I know if I contributed positively to what just happened or negatively? Well, you could say as a neuron, there's times where I almost spiked. There's times where I just barely spiked. I can compare to the two of them, giving me a readout of my actual causal effect. And if we, up, if we do it like this, we have much faster convergence. Now, let's talk about a second quasi-experimental technique, instrumental variables. So, so, so hold on, let, let me actually first zoom out a little about regression discontinuity. What we did there is we knew one thing about the world, which is there's a threshold that determines the, 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 the treatment and there's noise on the, on the x-axis. Those two pieces of knowledge allowed me to come up with a meaningful local causal estimate. This is typical. When, whenever we do successful causal inference from observational data, there's some aspects about the world that we know. And from there, it's like this fixed point that allows us to, uh, to, to like, uh, move the universe in a way. Like, like it's, it's this hard point where we can do something with it. I'll not talk about instrumental variables, which equally makes, requires some prior knowledge. Now you can say, what we, what we can say here is we have a variable that's truly random that affects maybe one neuron. Now then we wanna know how that neuron affects another neuron. Now there's a whole world, a whole brain of stuff that affects neuron one and neuron two, but we now have special prior knowledge, which is this random variable only affects neuron one. It cannot under any circumstances affect another neuron directly. It can affect all other neurons, but only through neuron one. If this assumption is wrong, this technique is completely useless. But if that assumption is right, then we can figure out causality. Why? Let's, let's first have the intuition. If neuron one is correlated to neuron two, that doesn't mean anything. Now, it could be that the world correlates the two of them. But if the random variable is correlated with neuron two, then neuron one must have caused neuron two's activity because that's the only path from randomness to neuron two. So that's why it should be possible. And um, now we will directly jump into a neuroscience application. People in neuroscience very much like uh, optogenetics. No? It's a super interesting technique that perturbs things. There's the law on the street that optogenetics is a localized technique. Not like you read lots of papers where they're like, we optogenetically activate area X and we find that the mouse does Y are so different. So let me argue against that idea. So the photon flow, so, so absorption in brains is extremely small. The, the free length might be a centimeter range. Absorption is very low. Therefore, the photon flow in first order approximation is one over d squared. Now, like basically the sphere gets to be larger and larger as I get further away from my light guide. So we have a one over d squared photon flow property. Now, how many neurons are there that are gonna be affected by our light? Well, n squared, you know, like we have that surface and we have like a certain shell on it and that shell is like d squared. Okay, so the product of photons and neurons is constant, but it gets much worse. It turns out that the current that is produced is proportional to log photon flow, which means now that it, with optogenetics, we produce much more overall spiking activity far away from where we stimulate than close to where we stimulate. So that whole idea, that whole research programs are built on 
is being held back by like a rather simple logical mistake here. I should say that the solution for this is very simple. Now, like part, some of the top labs do that. You can, for example, only put, like, put make neurons locally active by only, in, uh, by only injecting a virus very locally, in which case you, you're local, not because of optogenetics, you're local because of the way you put in things. Or, and this is another solution that is very easy. I just haven't managed to talk anyone into it make brains be black. So if they can, no, like, like simply making brain cells express melanin would make this whole problem go away and optogenetics would all of a sudden be localized methods. Okay, and now um, all, TMS of course has the same problem. So why is this an issue that, that we have non-local things? Um, let's say we optogenetically stimulate we stimulate neurons A and B, there will always be multiple local neurons, and we record from neuron C. Now we can look at correlations. Now A and B are of course very strongly correlated. Well, we hit them at the same time with some light. Okay, and of course B and C are correlated because hey, that's a causal effect. But A and C are almost as, as well correlated simply because that same light signal makes both neurons active. So the question is, could we disambiguate this? And um, here's again, back to instrumental variables. Um, like, I just want to mention that it's used in lots of other domains. For example, they look at gene SNPs, which arguably are localized. They have an effect on cholesterol, which they understand. Then smoking affects cholesterol and uh, uh, myocardial infection. And then we can again use the gene SNPs as basically an instrument. And uh, that technique is, oh, this technique has a great name that I just can't, that I'm just blanking on, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, oh, in any case, <laughs> uh, here's an example uh, from social sciences, civic engagement. No, so people say, uh, people might want to ask, does going to college make you politically more engaged? Oh, talking about politically more engaged. Um, I want to just uh, highlight a nice example that we discussed just before we started, uh, which is there's a strong correlation of my talk with bringing uh, with uh, uh, with uh, the change of presidential leadership in America. I'll start my talk in the discussion with Donald Trump as president. I will end my talk with Joe Biden as president, and therefore I'm now just for the fun of it claiming that my talk makes. Joe Biden be our president. Uh, but like uh, back to this example, uh, we can use the distance to the nearest college as an instrument. It turns out that if you live close to a college, you're much, much more likely to study. And you can, and what we wanna know is, does that college make you more likely to be politically engaged? Does it make you more likely to be, to register to vote? So what's the assumption here? The distance to college affects your probability of attending college, there's no reason why the distance to a college would directly affect your probability to register, uh, to register as a voter. That might be wrong. And this is when you do quasi experiments, the way to prove that someone is wrong is weirdly in this discussion. You're like, okay, these are the assumptions you make. I disagree with this assumption. I don't think that distance to college is actually not directly affecting the registration. And you could say, well, it could be that students are doing organizing and bring people that are nearby directly to register the vote. You could then test that with people that are maybe there already before the college was started and therefore cannot have been affected in this ways of asking those questions. So for us, what we'll do is we'll ask if a neuron being refractory but like you can say it's almost, it's not the perfect random variable, but like in first order approximation it is. We have a neuron and if it's refractory, then being stimulated has no influence on it. So there's, if you want a spike missing, and then we construct this instrumental variable model, uh, the stimulation goes to spiking and only the spike uh, being refractory only affects that one neuron. And we can observe it by having seen the spike earlier, affects spiking, which affects postsynaptic neuron and all the brain kind of confounds spiking in the postsynaptic neuron. Here's the Walt estimator. And then we do, uh, we implement that in a big system. And what we see here using instrumental variable as opposed to looking at correlation, 
half squared of it. Why does it matter? Um, well, optogenetics is arguably the best causal tool that we have, but it's crazy hard to target individual cells. What we'd like to have in neuroscience at some level is methods to infer the causality between a large number of potentially perturbed units. And, um, and basically, no, no like uh, the, the optogenetics is causally clean, but it is, uh, it is low dimensional. Correlation matrices are causally wrong, but, but, but they're beautifully scalable, not like any number of neurons that you, uh, that you record. So we're trying to see if we can find in between domains there. Now, um, I should briefly, yeah, I should wrap up, I think. Uh, uh, briefly in machine learning, it's also interesting how we usually ignore it. You know, like people use Judea Pulse do calculus, which can be used to prove that you're confounded, and then they use it to argue that they're not confounded. And uh, Dave Bly's deconfound also doesn't work in the real world. I'll be happy to like at a later point of time to discuss that. So causality is hard and we can only do it if we know things in the world. And machine learning has this idea that we can, that we can do independent intelligence that doesn't require complexity. That it, in a way it sells the vision that we don't need to think about things, that we can have algorithms that think about things. Causality very much teaches us that we can only find out things if we have certain prior knowledge and that certain prior knowledge needs to be incorporated. So what's the take home message? For everyone who studies uh, neuroscience or cognitive science, I think when we talk about mechanisms, we really mean causality. That's, that's what the word means for us. In lots of cases, we don't really provide relevant information about causality, simply because we're so heavily confounded. I think perturbations are the gold standard here, but they don't scale. And like I can put you into a scanner, TMS zap you in some area or some other area, but I cannot do that on hundreds of areas within a short period of time. I think quasi-experiments are important as they open a new domain in which we can do observational causality in a meaningful way. Uh, we just need really, really big data sets. Now, uh, of course, I did none of these things. I just want to thank the people who actually did it. Ben Lansdahl worked on the neuro theory parts. Michael Leperot worked on optogenetics for causality. And then pa Pat Lala, Joanna Marinesco, and Tony Leo, who I forgot to list here, have been working on, uh, on causality and tutorials for causality. And I want to thank all of you for listening. Thank you, Conrad. So uh, now we are open for questions. You could raise your uh, virtual hand and we can start. Um, okay, so uh, while people are... Um... Oh, okay, Alex has a question. Please, Alex. Coming to the rescue. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thanks very much, Conrad, for the great talk. Um, I am very much agree with with all this way of thinking about causality and so on. I wanted to ask you about the um, um, the part about the confounders and how not taking into account uh, the hidden variables that are not measured, observed, uh, really dominates the the correlations that we observe. And um, and the one conclusion is that more data doesn't really help. I want to ask you, like, uh, if we think of it in, in probabilistic terms, does more data reduce the our uncertainty or, in other words, increase our confidence about what the correlations tell us? And in that way, OK, we cannot solve the whole thing with just more data, but can we uh, become more confident about what we observe? Well, um, in the limit of large amounts of data, we can become positive about the correlation methods. But it turns out that there is an unavoidable invariance class of models that all predict exactly the same correlation matrix. And when I say correlation matrix, 
add your nonlinear extensions of that. Now, like none of them like really change things. So, like we we have that um, we have that real uncertain we have that real invariance class, and in some cases you can construct it. Now, like like uh, if you have, for example, let's say we have neon A affecting neon B with strength one, we can replace produce exactly the same correlation by introducing an unobserved neuron C that induces the corresponding linear correlation between the two neurons. So that, that just highlights, you know, and it, it matters for our interpretation. It doesn't matter for the correlation, the correlation matrix is the correlation, it's real. But it matters for our interpretation because in one case we will say, well, A affects B, in the other case we say, well, A and B are just reflections of the same underlying variable. And you can show that, they're, that, that the joint statistics are exactly identical between those. And in fact, for any real interaction, I can construct a network where a fake interaction gives rise to exactly the same dynamics. So, so there is a real invariance class. And that invariance class is, of course, very, very large because like, if we have 10, uh, 10 to the 11 unobserved neurons, 100 observed ones, well, the invariance class is like roughly 10 to the 11 minus 100. So it's a, it's a, it's a big class. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it's I've no freelance uh, theory of, of machine learning. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's related to it, I guess. It's, it's like a bit, but it's, it's, about invariance classes in causality. I think it's a little, it's a level more concrete than the no free lunch theorem, but, uh, but yes, it's, it's, you cannot, you need knowledge to be able to learn. And, and in a way, those two are deeply related. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Peter? Yeah, great talk, I love it. Um, you repeatedly refer to a neuron in a big brain. And I would expect that if you, when you factor out 10 to the 11 minus a few confounders, essentially nothing is left. So the signal to noise ratio will be really, really bad, even if you could manage the confounders. And I'm not so sure that I actually want to know the influence of a single neuron in the brain. So, okay, Michel Precht makes vis red whiskers wiggle by stimulating single neurons. But the, let's this as an exception. So I have the double problem. I want to record from, let's say, many neurons and identify a group of neurons which jointly have a causal significant inference. So I would like to estimate out of recording of 100 neurons or let's say n square neurons, the subgroup n, which is relevant. Right. So, so I think if, if you want to do those things, uh, it, it depends on how you want to think about brains. And the thing that easily comes to your rescue, there's like the idea of weak specialization, where there's just brain regions that are more involved with, say, vision, and there's brain regions that are more involved with audition. And among those, there's neurons. No, so you, you could say that if I'm looking for a neuron co uh, that, that, that's causally affecting a certain sound or so, uh, a certain sound perception or something, you could say in all likelihood, it would be correlated. There might be lots of neurons that are correlated with that. And there might be through that, through that specialization idea, they might all the, the causally relevant neurons might sit together in some area, in which case you can say that hitting all the neurons that are correlated with it might be like a fast order step with it. Um, but what would you do in practice? Now, in practice, it's rather that for say prosthetic bidirectional prosthetic devices, we want to stimulate somewhere, and what we do is we stimulate somewhere where it's correlated with it. And then we optimize the parameters of how we stimulate. And so, so, so in practice, we then go into the domain where we put up. And, um, and that's the other constraint, no? like that if I want to electrically stimulate, I can't avoid but stimulate like a local cluster of neurons. So in that sense, the question is really, what is best? Should I look at like clusters of neurons that are correlated with 
the variables I'm interested in? Or should I use like a rough specialization? Yeah, we have ratid notape, we're like roughly in that area. And, uh, and neurons here tend to be correlated with that and that search within that area, which is probably pretty close to the algorithm we use. But yes, no, like, like the, the thing isn't that in generally, in general, we can't learn about say local specialization. In fact, we do learn about local specialization and we put electrodes in area MT. It feels like things are moving. We, we put areas in, in decision related, uh, uh, electrodes into decision related areas and we bias people or, or like we bias animals around. So there's these things. And the idea that there's like some, at some large scale, some specialization, that idea is true. Like, like the evidence is pretty good. Now, like if you look at lesion studies, sure, there's areas where if you have lesions, you don't talk. And so, yeah, that makes it much more likely that that's actually a causal, causally related area to, to, to talking. And, and there is this notion that's just empirically true that there's some local clustering of causal effects probably. But I don't think we can, at an individual neuron level, actually identify it. And, and here's another fun calculation. So um, it's possible that, that neuroscience, in the sense where we want to find out what individual neurons do, do or even groups of neurons do, that it's fundamentally impossible. Let me, let me highlight why. So um, the number of spikes you can get out of a neuron is kind of pretty hard upper bounded by roughly a million, just because like, you can only record for so long from a given neuron. So, so let's take that roughly as an upper bound. Now, a cortical neuron is what's the current estimate? 3,000 synapses or something. So if a neuron has 3,000 synapses and I could take all the presynaptic 3,000 neurons and I could randomize perturb them. In that case, we have 3,000 inputs. Uh, we have one output. We have a million spikes at our disposal. We could reasonably expect that we can estimate that vector. But this is an absolute ideal case scenario. But, but, but even there, imagine now that the neuron is nonlinear. <laughs> now, once we allow it to be interestingly nonlinear, all of a sudden we have far more parameters. All of a sudden we can no longer make all dimensions be orthogonal to one another, in which case I cannot identify an individual neuron in the lifetime of an animal. So in that sense, it, it may be that that approach of trying to really understand the computational role that every individual neuron has, that might be an impossible promise. It's a promise that certain parts of the field feel very strongly about, but, but if it's true that it's impossible, there are great alternatives. Now we can say, well, we can't understand what individual neurons do, but we can understand maybe the learning rules that they have that bring them there. And uh, that is then if we agree that this figure out what every neuron does is not gonna be possible, then that becomes to be probably the most interesting approach. So uh, very nice back of the envelope estimate. Uh, I have to digest that one. Very good. Um, however, I would argue that the neuron has the same problems. It must find out what it should do under these conditions. And obviously the brain works in a certain way for better or worse. So <laughs> there are constraints. There are, and if we const use these constraints in neurons experience as priors in our interpretation of the data, can't we use the same trick? Possibly. So um, Tim Lollicrap with me, we wrote this like fun little paper where we argue a little against it. So you can say we live in this exceptionally complicated world. Not like it's, it's full of rather arbitrary things. And the amount of data that neurons collectively capture from the environment that is around us is mind boggling right? Like we have petabytes worth of training data and all that training data kind of set, set somewhere distributed in a matrix of connections. Um, it's not clear if we can formulate that matrix as the kind of prior that you're looking for. But no, because, because that matrix at some level contains 
Peter Koenig was my PhD supervisor. No, but like it's distributed across like countless different synapses, but like no theory of Conrad's brain could be complete without that knowledge. And now the question is, are there like these big principles that we can discover that in like Peter Koenig being my supervisor is a special case? Or is it rather that basically all the mass, now like for certain distributions, all the mass is in the tails. So you could say that, that sure, like there are some like big principles, like it's bright during the day, it's dark during the night, like things like this, that they describe a good amount of variance. But the question is about the reverse. What does the bulk of your brain tissue deal with? Does it deal with like the standard cases of like, oh yeah, look, there's an edge is kind of straightish. Or does it deal with like, oh, there is a Van Gogh painting or something. It, 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 not like the question is how much of the variance that we want to explain is in the body of the distribution, how much is in the tail? And, and my hunch is that all the, all the information is basically in the tail, in which case these compact dis descriptions can never produce satisfactory models. But that's only my hat that I wear when I feel pessimistic. And I have to, I have to think about that one. Cool answer. Thanks, it, Conrad. It, it, it'd be very, it'd be very curious about how 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 you would back up the envelope this. So 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 everyone like the discussion that Peter and me are having is actually, from my perspective, one of the important modes of thinking about brains, which is back of the envelope calculations. That there are all these things and. It matters a, a huge lot, roughly where we are. For example, how many neurons are, like what's the distance between two neurons? It matters hugely for how we should design microscopes to, to look at, uh, at, uh, at neurons. No? Like what's the typical distance? In fact, it's a great question. Who, who wants to venture a guess here? A couple of micrometers, maybe? I don't know. A couple of micrometers, yeah, like a couple of tens of micrometers, but yeah, that's, that's just roughly right. Now, like, and with these back of the envelope calculations, the order of magnitude matters. Now, being off like by factor three or even 10, like, usually doesn't matter. So, what does that mean? Now, like, if the distance between neurons is like order 20 microns, we cannot observe them with certain techniques, we can observe them with visible light. We cannot observe them with very far infrared light because it will be much longer than that, unless we use multi-photon approaches or something. So, so, so at some level, there's an awful lot of insight into the nature of the brain that we can ha can come up with. Or like, what's the amount of information that you're going to store over your lifetime? No, and like. We will probably, if we think about it a little bit, come out with results like within a factor of 10 of one another. And like you could say, my personal private estimate is that it might be of the order of 10 bits per second. Um, you might say it's one bit, you might say it's 100 bit, well, but we will probably all be in a similar range. And that then matters for the way we would want to build models for cognition. And the big master of that is, is Markus Meister for people who haven't seen that. He, he wrote some wonderful papers that debunked whole ranges of neuroscience by just saying, look, <laughs> this can't work. And here's why, because physics wise, it's factor 100 off. And, uh, and he's always right about that. In fact, I wish there was a book that basically back of the envelope everything in neuroscience. There's, there's, there's so, so many different questions there. Um, Conrad, I have a question for you, sorry. Yeah, sure. um, so uh, when you talk about uh, instrumental variables, it seems like uh, the choice can be arbitrary, right? So we don't know which instrumental variable to take because any, uh, I mean, when it comes to causality, we are dealing with unknown unknowns and uh, which, which variable is going to explain 
this causal relation i'm i so it seems a bit arbitrary how you choose that okay uh, let me argue exactly the opposite so uh, so so usually quasi experiments and instrumental variables are impossible and in very small number of cases it is possible and then it's very not arbitrary in my view and um so so we need for instrumental variables we need certain prior knowledge that that we can have the knowledge precisely is it's a it needs to be for something to be an instrument it needs to be a variable that we can observe it needs to be a variable that affects that neuron's behavior and it needs to be a variable that directly doesn't affect anyone else's behavior that comes that conjunction of three things makes it that in most cases there is no instrument and in some cases there is an instrument and so economists have over time gotten very good at seeing things that are like uh, like instruments for example weather no arguably the weather affects certain variables and only a certain subset of variables and then you could say well and in this case weather strongly affects how people behave but not how uh, how their 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 workplace acts or something no like uh, but 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 again like these guys are basically looking for things that are the best approximation to instruments and that i like like see an instrument when it's there i think that that's uh, that's really important and then you can say in 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 neurons where where are potential instruments what well, needs to be something that's like locally well constrained no but it could be what do you know it could be that there's good instruments so so people in machine learning use this uh, procedure called dropout to regularize neurons often and some people have said well there could be some neurons somewhere in the brain that basically randomly drop out a whole brain area and if that was the case and we could record from those neurons and we could see oh whenever that neuron goes the whole brain area shuts off and that neuron is totally random then all of a sudden we'd have an instrument to try and understand how uh, how that brain area works but 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 we are still faced with this problem of basically looking for possible instruments or regression discontinuities and things like that and then once we have them we can convince ourselves how good they are as instruments right? and say when it comes to the refractory periods the problem that we run into is actually that you're right there's something wrong about that model which is you're only refractory if you just spiked which means that the percolated signal of you having spiked is still in the network and therefore you aren't technically uh, therefore you aren't technically producing a proper instrument and you can then say if i take that in or out of my simulations how does that change and you can thereby convince yourself that you have a good or bad instrument and we're currently trying to overcome that using some other tricks but yes it's kind of about like looking at the world with this view like what are things that are kind of random like for example if you want to learn from other people doing things you can you can say what's a good way of learning a policy well i want to learn it, look at people who are really good at doing it because they probably have good policies and i can find out what it, what they appear to be optimizing now what if we want to ask the reverse question i want to find out how the world really works do i want to look at the most informed or the least informed person well in that case the least informed person because they know nothing and everything they do is just random and i can really figure out what, how the world works by looking at them so it's 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 interesting to think in these terms no because like the perfectly random useless person at a task is actually a great instrument no they go through things and knock things it's great <laughs> whereas the person who is perfectly informed they saw that thing around the corner and realized they needed to do this and they do that and it's like a, it's a complex causal chain effect of absolutely everything um maybe then a follow up to that uh, how much success have you had with uh, instrumental variables in your own research have you have you tried some uh, 
uh, with uh, you know finding these causal relations between neurons so we don't we we aren't advanced enough there that we have experiments that test that. And I'm like, I can only answer your question if I then actually go in and electrically or optogenetically stimulate individual neurons and see what the effect is. We haven't done that. In fact, we aren't even finished with our simulations. So, so in that sense, no, I can't tell you. Um, we are we are looking at areas where thing where the use of such methods is very natural, like in medicine. In medicine, weirdly, you no, know, in machine learning, you're used to this culture of shared data sets where you have a data set, lots of photos, it says what's a cat and what's a dog, and everyone uses it and is happy about it. In causality, even that hasn't really happened yet. Yes, there's like a few emerging causality competitions that are wonderful, but they don't seem to be in the right domain. Or like it has like the growth of muscles or anemones that like uh, how it affects over time. And but but these are very simplistic problems that don't have the real world flavor that medicine has. You'd think that the medical community would get together and data setify the field. What that means is. Give me lots of cases where you have what we did to people in an RCT, what happened to them, which is ground truth. And now let, get, let's, let me get like observational data that is in line with that. Let's do that for 100 randomized control trials. Let's see how we can advance effectively what's epidemiological methods and like causal, causal inference methods that say, let me estimate what the RCT result will be before we do that. It would be billions upon billions of dollars because most RCTs fail and it would really promise to do things a lot better. But the medical field is the most corrupt field in there. If you want any data, they want to be co-authors. If you want to do like anything there, they want to own it. They don't even give you the data. So we had that case where we wanted to do regression discontinuity for a stroke drug. But instead of them sending us the data, we had to go through those statisticians that were not, let's say, a little less agile than people in my group would have been doing it ourselves. So it's very pragmatic in that way. But if we want to really improve medicine, we need to produce these data sets where we know causal truth and we know how the data looks like before so that we can really have a positive competition that really makes the methods be good. And that's quite disturbing. Yeah, in this day and age, it's, um, it's a bit scary that uh, medical data is not uh, you know, openly available. Um, or, I mean, drug data, at least. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's right, yeah. Uh, like, <laughs> that culture of openness that has happened in machine learning has, has suddenly not really happened in medicine yet. And I'm trying to talk uh, leading people into, uh, into leading the church in that area. It comes with a cost, though. <laughs> Too much focus on the data sets and <laughs> a little juice. It, it, it comes at a cost. You know? like there's little doubt that the focus on state of the art is a disaster for, for creativity in machine learning. So there's an interesting observation. Um, most people that are real innovators in machine learning come from a machine uh, from a neuroscience background. Is that because neuroscience is so useful for machine learning? No. Like if you make a list of what machine learning has really learned from neuroscience, it's a pretty small list. But there's a big advantage. If you do neuroscience, you basically permit yourself to do machine learning slash AI research where you want to figure out how stuff works. Just by saying, okay, I'm building a model of the brain, go away with your competitions. And then once you've done that long enough, you might win in the competitions. But in between, you're kind of in an intellectual safe space where you can innovate and come up with good ideas and you can justify alluding to cognition or neuroscience. And then once you come out on the other side, you will have thought a lot of thoughts that if you were just chasing state of the art, you would never get. And unfortunately, more and more, as Alex suggested, uh, 
the field is just chasing SOTA and it's, uh, and it turns out that very ugly solution give you state of the art on a lot of data sets. Okay, more questions. Okay, so since there are no more questions, uh, let's wrap up this session. Thank you again, Conrad. Uh, this was a lovely talk. Um, a lot of uh, good questions have uh, uh, you know, come up because of this. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thanks uh, everyone for having me. Thanks for listening. And it was a great honor to be there. Thanks. <laughs>